Bitcoin first emerged in 2008, the initial paper and software came from someone going by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto. And the idea behind this system was that it would be a financial network outside the control of government, outside the control of banks. And it would do this by creating this sort of network, much like the internet, that was run by the people actually using the currency. In 2011, a series of booms and busts overtook Bitcoin and brought it into the public consciousness. Like any utopian technology, Bitcoin has really run up against the outer limits of what it's trying to do as it has spread around the world. Antes de nada, entender mucho Bitcoin, en que cómo, qué, qué carrizo es, cómo existe, y no puede entender que es simplemente un archivo, un libro donde están anotados todas las transacciones que están ocurriendo a nivel mundial. Y además, es que ese libro es público, el libro de acceso. Y lo bueno, y lo bárbaro, y lo revolucionario, y lo groundbreaking de este, de este asunto es que el libro está siendo escrito en consenso. Imagínense si hay un poco de gente que le encanta un libro como, no sé, vamos a poner cosas que ponen en consenso a los cristianos, la Biblia, o cosas que ponen en consenso a los judíos, en la Torá. Pero estamos hablando de un libro donde ponen en consenso todos los usuarios financieros y en una forma de todos podemos estar de acuerdo en lo que se escribió y todos lo podemos revisar constantemente. Eso es Bitcoin, simplemente. La primera vez en la historia de la humanidad que nos podemos poner de acuerdo de una forma tecnológica para poder hacer algo en conjunto en lo que estemos en consenso. Y eso es un cambio de, de paradigma en lo que está en la de la humanidad. Creo que vamos a hacer los trabajos en consenso y descentralizado. El futuro es brillante. Never before was someone able to put it together in a real, real system, a softer system, because double spending was the biggest thing that you couldn't overcome. With gold, it's easier. With something physical, it's easy. I give you a piece of gold, you have it, I don't have it because I gave it to you. But with digital information, I give you a digital photograph. It's a, in essence, I'm giving you a copy of it. When I give it to you, you have it, but I also have it. With currency and digital money, we can't allow for that. Because if we did allow for that, then it's, it's, it's practically useless, right? So how do you solve that problem? Researchers have been looking at this for the last you know, 20, 40 years. And finally, 2008, 2009, we have a version of Bitcoin that solved the problem through the notion of a global ledger called blockchain. Blockchain's a buzzword, <laughs> so I'm not entirely sure what it means. I think it depends on the speaker. Um, in general, I think when people say blockchain, they mean the idea of a record of transactions that's secure and, and distributed. Where we sit today, companies like Facebook and Google, Amazon, Apple, they are increasingly sitting on all of our data. Every time somebody amasses one of these big monopolies, something comes along that's just a complete and total game changer, and I think it's blockchain technology. It is a buzzword, but at the same time, it's a word that refers to a particular thing, and that particular thing is really useful, and you can build a lot of stuff on it. There's a lot of ways to describe it. Like, one phrase that, I, that Robert Sams used that I really, really like is decentralized automation. So the idea that you can sort of run various kinds of processes in a way that, number one, is completely automated, so you get just huge gains and efficiency out of that, and number two, that's decentralized, so which means that Number one, like there's no sort of process that can get corrupted by one particular entity. And number two, there's no process that just requires a central entity and then just sort of naturally we, you know, creates too much opportunity for that central entity to become a monopoly. There's a variety of ways in which this technology, in its current iteration, and by that I mean distributed ledger and blockchain rather than Bitcoin, moves away from the founding principles of Bitcoin around um, anonymity and replaces it with certain known actors within a regulated financial system. 
but none of that inevitably means anything. Here's the way I would say it. People always overestimate what technology can do in two years, but underestimate what it can do in 10. The people who think that somehow the Bitcoin is gonna bring in some libertarian paradise where we're not gonna have know your customer rules and we're not gonna have rules on money transfer, that won't happen. The people who think that all the currency is gonna be debauched and we're gonna have hyperinflation and Bitcoin's our salvation, I think they're wrong too. In a world where we've got uh, a real struggle to get up to 2% inflation anywhere in the industrial world. But is the blockchain technology gonna be fundamental to reducing frictions? I think the answer is overwhelmingly likely that it's gonna be yes. Larry Summers was talking about how blockchain is here to stay and Bitcoin technology is amazing and it's gonna change all the ways that the financial systems in the world work. But if early Bitcoiners like myself think that we're gonna be able to have anonymous transactions that are private from the government and that people are actually allowed to do what they want with their own money, uh, he said we're wrong about that. But uh, I think one of us is gonna be wrong and I don't think it's gonna be me. I kind of knew that that day would come in which the people that share my worldview are gonna be the minority in, in Bitcoin. But I think that's also a sign that we're winning, that now this many other people are interested in this technology, that someone that seems to have shared a similar worldview to my own created, that's, that's pretty exciting. I'm, Bank of America and Wells Fargo and Western Union are, are here and in space. I'm, that means we're winning. And, and hopefully it means that they won't be able to co-opt what we've built so far and, and turn it into some sort of hierarchical system in which you know governments are able to monitor every single transaction that people make. That would be my nightmare outcome. There's now sort of this battle between you know, the, the people who originally brought this thing into the world and who wanted this to be a sort of revolutionary new technology that would help free people from governments and banks. And now, on the other side, there are governments and banks that are themselves trying to use this technology to change the way that we use money, to change the way that information is stored. And I think it's very much an open question as to where this ends up.